Now, as we begin, at least on the sermon this morning, um, I want to ask a question that I know that some of you aren't even going to know. Primarily, those of you who were born, let's say, after uh, probably like 98, even in the mid-90s, are not going to know the answer to this question. But for those of you who were born before that, so it's going to date some of us, where were you on September 11th? Sleeping. Hey, there you go. You, you slept. So that's wonderful. But if I ask that question, we can all think of a place where we were. And typically, for most of you, you can, you can remember the moment that you turned the TV on. Or that someone called you and said, have you heard? You can remember the moments that have led up to that. Now, for those of you who were not uh, old enough to remember what happened on September 11th, that's 2001, I can ask a new question, and this question is going to be what defines your generation. Where were you the day of the shutdowns? And you're going to say, well, I can remember these days. And I can ask that for most of you. Where were you when the shutdowns began, when, when everything began kind of closing up? These moments in our lives seem to define who we are, or at least define a lot about us. But as I think about September 11th, I want to focus back to that for just a moment. Here's the question that I want us to have. The day that, so let's just say September 12th, 2001, did anyone call their real estate agent and ask to buy land in Afghanistan? Iraq. Did anyone call the real estate agent and want to speak to anyone in the Middle East about a purchase in the Middle East saying, I have a feeling that land over there is going to be worth something, and I'm going to buy as much as I can for a bottom dollar? Did anyone else do that? I didn't. I said anyone else like I did. I did not do that. That's really the story that we're in today. Jeremiah chapter 32 is our text for today, and Jeremiah is... It is in this situation where an event like a 9-11 is occurring for him and his people, for his region. Jeremiah, at this point, is trapped in prison inside the king's prison inside Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is in this stuck position. And the way that the chapter opens up is that the king of Babylon has built siege ramps against Jerusalem or is in the process of building these siege ramps against Jerusalem for the point of capturing the city. It's not looking good for Jerusalem. This has been a major battle that has probably gone on for about a year now. And so at this whole time period, people are starving in the streets. Water supplies are running dry or dim or muck, murky, mucky, muddy, whatever. Life inside Jerusalem is not good. It's an all-out war on the outside. And in our account, in the overall story, and we're gonna, we'll are gonna we focus in on individual verses here just in a moment, but on the overall story, Jeremiah is called by God to buy property in a war zone. He is called to buy land in an Iraq or in Afghanistan after a 9-11 situation, and has said, look, you're going to buy this land because someday I'm going to bring you back. You see, this story that Jeremiah gives us is really a story of faith, and works. It's a story about belief and action. Because as we look at the overall story, it's one thing to know that God's going to do something, but it's another thing for us to act and to fulfill through our life what God has told us he's going to do. Let me use an example. And this is one that is a fairly simple one. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, there is an act that we follow that with, typically the act of baptism in our belief. So when we have that belief, we accompany those beliefs with action to show, to give confirmation, and to acknowledge on a public standard that, yes, this is my belief. Another one, when we decide to get married... We have a wedding service, and typically it's either, you know, just a few people, just a couple of witnesses, or it's a whole bunch of people, and we've invited everyone and their dog, and they show up, and the point of the wedding service is to publicly confess our love for someone else. It's about showing on a public sphere 
the things that we believe inside. It's about taking our faith and putting action to it. When we come to Jeremiah chapter 32, that's really the point that Jeremiah is going to be hitting with us today. Is do your actions prove or show the beliefs that you have? Do your actions show your beliefs? The first one that I want to hit at really comes at verse 2. And that's the reality that do your actions show your belief when your life is under the siege? Notice in verse 2, it says, The army of the king of, of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet is confined in the palace. He's confined, and by the way, when we say palace, it's not like he's at the Ritz-Carlton. He's in a pretty bad place. He's in the dungeon. Think of that. But what is life like for Jeremiah when he and everyone around him, their life is being pressed in under siege? When the arrows are flying in over the wall and the enemy is building a ramp up the wall, what was Jeremiah's life like? Now granted, he's locked in a jail cell in the basement and the dungeon of some sort of a, of a castle-like property or a, you know, a palace-like property. And we're told, I think it's in verse 3, it doesn't matter, that basically he's there because he's, talk, he's talked out against the king. He said, look, we're, we're going to the land of the Chaldees. This is it. We're done for. I look at Jeremiah in that moment, and I say, was Jeremiah living a life of despair? When Jeremiah was in prison, was he depressed? Was he bummed out? Was he thinking, maybe, how do I end my own life so that someone else doesn't take me? By the way, I don't think any of those were really the point that Jeremiah was thinking I think, if anything, Jeremiah may be the person that when life was pushing in, when all of the bad stuff that could possibly be occurring was happening, that in some way Jeremiah is looking for hope. He's looking for what is the future. And it's the future beyond even the few moments that are about to occur immediately. That Jeremiah looks to the long-distance future. Mind you, he buys a field in the property or in the region around Jerusalem. So if he buys a field in the area that he's, that's kind of around him, he's obviously not thinking about the immediate future. Because currently he's in jail. Currently uh, Babylon is about to take him off into captivity. And that's actually what begins to happen to Jeremiah. But he's looking 70 years in the future. And he knows that. Jeremiah 32 comes after Jeremiah 29, which is the text we just said. And in 29, we're told there's 70 years ahead. Jeremiah is well aware of the long-term future that he's dealing with. And Jeremiah, by the way, at this time, he's not some spring chicken. I mean, it's not like he's the young guy anymore. He's getting up there. And yet he still buys land looking for what is ahead. That brings me to the thought for us is, what do we do when our lives are under siege? Have you felt in your life like Satan was building a siege ramp against your life? Where there was a wall that you said, this is, this is my protection, this is my hedge, this is my bubble. And all of a sudden, Satan's popping it. Every little inch that he can get, he is doing something to get closer and closer to bringing pain, punishment, difficulty, and struggle to your life. Maybe it was the call where someone very dear to you passed away. Maybe it was the call when the doctor said, it's irreversible. You will not make it. Maybe the difficulties of our life, when all of the struggle is building this pressure, maybe it's when the debt collectors have been calling and they finally filed lawsuit. When the pressures of our life begin to push and push and push and we feel no escape, what do we do? Do we start looking at all the pressures around? Do we look at the siege ramps? Do we look at the battle? Do we look at everything that's around and do we fall into a case of despair? Or do we look and we say, you know what? 70 years in the future, is this going to matter? 70 years in the future, is it going to matter 
what the doctor told me, what the police officer told me, what the debt collector told me, what anyone in this world has told me. In 70 years, will that matter? And for some of you, 70 years is still within this lifetime. Some of you, 70 years will be outside of this lifetime. Will the problems you deal with today really matter in 70 years? And then the question is, if it doesn't matter in 70 years, how much should it bother us today? Let me just ask you, and I want you to think, and if you feel like answering, feel free to. The problems you have today, take them 70 years in the future. So what year? We're in 21 right now. What's 21 plus 7? 91, thank you. So 2091. What's going to matter? What will be important to you in 2091? Moving on a little bit in our text. We come to verse 8. By the way, when... In verse, yeah, verse 8, and really, yeah, verse 8, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out where I'm at in the text here. Verse 8, what happens is, is that Jeremiah hears the voice of God, and God tells him, buy this field. Buy it from a, from a cousin, I think so it is. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the garden and said, buy my field as a redemption. And then at the very end, it says, I know that this was the word of the Lord. What I take by the intro of that verse, in verse 8, how he says that he heard the Lord say, and then the end of that verse where it says, I knew this was the word of the Lord, is that basically between that, he knew God said it, but it took a minute for it to hit. Have you ever had a moment where you thought you heard God speak, and you're like, was that really you, God? I think that's kind of a, a, a Jeremiah moment. He heard the voice of God, and in this moment, as things are happening, he's like, you want me to buy a field here? Really? And then... All of the stuff happens, and he says, oh, wait a second. This really was God. This is proving what I'm hearing. So as I look at this moment, I'm going to say, what hope do you have in the purposes of God? Are there times when you look at life and you say that, you know, hey, what, what does God really mean when he says this? Maybe there's times in your life where you felt the presence of God speak to you, and you say, God, how in the world does that fulfill your purpose, your mission, what, what you want me to accomplish? Maybe you're even the person who has prayed, and you've said, God, I don't know what to do. I think that's probably more for all of us, is it not? God, I don't know what to do. What would be the right choice for me right now? And then you sit back and you wait, if you're like me, because... I tend to, well, actually, I should say, if you're like me, you probably say, God, what do you want me to do? Oh, I know what you want me to do. You would do what I would want to do. That's tend to be what I do. But in the uncertain times of life, when God speaks, do we stop and listen? And then in Jeremiah's case, do we look for the things around us to define what we're knowing God to say? You see, there's this, I saw this sign one time, and it was... Um, it was actually like a little card, and it was, if you're looking for a sign to go to church, here it is. Do we look for signs in our own life, waiting for God to point us in a direction that we already know he's wanting us to go in? And I think that's happening to Jeremiah. He heard the voice of God, and he's saying, wait a second, this doesn't quite make sense. And then life happened and it says, oh, I know this is now what God wants. Maybe there have been times in our life where we've prayed, God, do you want me to make this move? Corey and Amanda, God, do you want him, them to make the move to Nashville? I'm joking. I know, I know where y'all are going. That's good. But we ask God, God, what decision do you want us to make? And then we stop and we wait. And then what, what I find comical is, is particularly when you have people, how many of you have ever prayed that prayer? God, which of these decisions do you want me to make? Am I the only person? I've got a few others. Okay, thank you for being honest now. So, God, which decision do you want me to make? What I find comical is when I have people who tell me they prayed that, and then they say that everything's pointing towards this one, but I just don't know. God was, 
if you prayed for that to be answered and God shows you the stuff or at least life circumstances happen that prove that this is the one, stop fighting it and go with it. And that's what Jeremiah does. He prayed. God spoke. And then life happened around him and he followed suit. You see, in the uncertainty of life, Jeremiah, right away, he's in a prison. He's in jail. And, and it's going to be very difficult because it's not like he could walk out to the uh, tag agent or the, uh, the title office and get all this stuff signed. Like, there's this whole process that he has to go through to make this happen. And, oh, by the way, we're told that he pays 17 shekels to make this happen, which really, I think that's, is that verse 9, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, that's verse 9. We go to verse 9, and it says that he paid 17 shekels to make this all happen. That he paid 17 shekels. By the way, 17 shekels is the equivalent of about $120 today, give or take. So he paid about 120 bucks for a chunk of land in the middle of a war zone at this time period. But, and, I, and the reason I'm focusing on the 17 for a moment is how much money does a person have when they're in jail? I'm sure there are probably some people who have a lot of money in their bank account in jail, but I have a feeling that Jeremiah might have spent every penny he had to buy this land. What's about to happen is, and he knows, that it's only a matter of time before Babylon conquers the city. It's only a matter of time before he's no longer a prisoner of Jerusalem, but he's a prisoner of Babylon. It's only a matter of time before his money isn't his money anymore. I mean, if I'm, a, if I'm a Babylonian guard and I come in and I'm going to take everyone in jail, I'm probably going to take your pocketbook too. So, you know, if, if I come and rob your house, I'm probably going to take your pocketbook as well. You, we think about these things. That's what they're going to go after. It's only a matter of time before Jeremiah has nothing to his name. So I'm going to imagine, this is speculation, he's got 17 bucks 120 bucks modern day in his bank account in his pocket and he says I'm going to spend all that I have to get this field I'm going to give it all away and even if things change now he's still broke now he's sitting on a field but I'm going to give everything I've got to what I know the promise of 70 years in the future is what I know is happening in the future that I may never see which brings me to us what are you willing to sacrifice today for 2091? What are you willing to sacrifice today for the future that you may not even see? Would you sacrifice something in your life so that 2091 or 2000 2191 or any year in the future, what would you sacrifice today so that that would be secure. Would you sacrifice your family? Would you sacrifice your job? Would you sacrifice your God? What becomes most important when you look that far out? So as we come to this, and I, I want to say, what would you sacrifice? I want to remind us of Jesus for a moment. The gospel message is really a message of sacrifice. What would you do to secure the future? And that's the gospel message. Would you give up your pride? Would you give up your selfishness? Would you give up your arrogance? Would you give up the language? Would you give up whatever vice or, or trait within you that you know is ungodly? Would you be willing to give that up? for what God is calling us to in a future that we will see someday. But we don't see right now. We don't see heaven. In the way that we can see it, we could probably see it somewhat in the church, among our community of people, but we don't see the, the street of gold. We don't see what John saw. Would we be willing to sacrifice ourselves for that future? Because is that not the gospel? That I would die to myself that I would live as Christ has called me to live? You see, the point that I think Jeremiah, or God is making through Jeremiah, in this whole land purchase agreement, 
is most important because he says it's not about what you believe, but it's about how you act. It's about what you're going to do with the beliefs that you have. James would tell us in James chapter 2 that faith without works is what? Someone finish it. Faith without works is dead. Show me your faith by your works, and I'll show you, or show, you, show me your faith apart from your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. You can believe all you want, James would even further to say, that even the demons believe. The problem then becomes is how do you act? And I think what Jeremiah, or God through Jeremiah is telling Jeremiah, but also telling us, is there is a future that we cannot see. But the way we live today, or, or one, the way we think today, should then impact the way we live today to look forward to a future that we do not see. So my question is, how do you live? What future do you live for? Do you live for the future that's here? And by here, I mean, are you so focused on your retirement planning that it's more about money, more about saving, more about sacrificing here and now for the here and now? No offense to anyone who's doing it. I mean, you know, that's good for you to plan. Don't say don't plan, but are you so focused on those things? Or are you so focused on the eternal plan that the things of this world just really don't matter? Where's your focus? I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what struggle you deal with. But as I go back to sacrifice, what are you willing to sacrifice? I'm going to be uh, down front for this next song. Bob has our application prayer, if I'm remembering correctly. Bob leads us in this application prayer today, really is a sign for all of us, that we are all called to see, how does God want the message to apply to me? How does Jeremiah 32 hit you? Because it hits me different than it hits you. And so as you pray the prayer, too, I want you to ask, God, how does this text apply to me? And if there is some way that we can encourage you, some way that we can support you, to be with you, um, after the service is over, I'll be out in the, right outside the doors in the foyer. would love the opportunity to make this, to help you, to, to provide you confidence. I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, Bob up. I don't, have I been calling you Mike? Bob. I'll ask Bob up to come lead us in an application prayer. It's not often that I'm caught speechless, but uh, that's a very thought-provoking sermon that you uh, preach this morning, Josh. We're, uh, it strikes me that we're pretty short-sighted creatures a lot of times. You know, we uh, some of us are probably sitting in our seats right now thinking about what we're going to have from lunch for lunch 10 minutes from now. And sometimes our, the thought we give to things extends just about that amount of time. And uh, I think Josh's message this morning uh, triggered that in me, uh, particularly when he made the comment about saving for retirement because I'm an investment advisor. That's what I do professionally. <laughs> <laughs> is, uh, is looking to that future, but I'm reminded that that is a short future. Uh, you know, I talk to people about 40 years from now, 30 years from now, 20 years from now, and in the grand scheme of things, God is infinite. You know, I think about the the early Christians that put their faith in Christ and the, were converted on the day of Pentecost and two centuries have passed. And we don't know. We may be around for another two centuries. And yet we're called to live every day as if Christ is coming tomorrow. And that's a difficult concept for us. So I think we have 
some things to think about today. So if you'll join me in prayer. Holy God, we're reminded that our ways are not your ways, that your ways are wiser, and that you have our best interest in, in your heart, that you have great love for us, that you have a plan for us, that you have a plan to prosper us and not harm us, and that our calling is to focus our minds and our hearts on you, that we would not be distracted by this earthly existence, but that we would look to the future that you have laid out for us, and that we, you would grant us the wisdom to understand your plan, to follow your word, to live according to that word, to the best of our ability, that we might one day in your time realize that future Enjoy the blessings that you have in mind for us and that our mission today and every day that you give us on this earth is to live our lives according to your plan and your word and according to the example that Christ set for us that we might be your humble servants, and through our lives build your kingdom to lead others to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and to enjoy the same benefits that we're looking forward to enjoying. Lord, we thank you for your mercy on us. We thank you for walking with us on a daily basis. We're privileged to be your children. We're honored to have you as a father. And we're honored and blessed to have Christ as our brother and our teacher. And Lord, we give you all the praise and thanks in your holy name. Amen.